Hello everyone, my name is Denise. I'm a counsellor and today I'll be talking on the topic of the uh, problem of evil and the concept of privation. So I've been stumbling upon some um, interesting uh, videos talking about the problem of evil and how uh, St. Thomas Aquinas was dealing with that. So I'm just going to read to you a, an important quote. Like Augustine, Aquinas, which means uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, denies that evil is any sort of real entity, any sort of positive ontological item. Rather, evil is privation, the lack of some subject of what ought to be there. As for example, blindness is the lack of sight in the person who by nature ought to see. As such, evil is decidedly not illusory. Privations abound, but we but when we affirm that existence, we are affirming that something is missing, not picking out entities of anything actual. So, okay, uh, that has many implications to um, my counselling practice, okay, or rather the counselling practice in general, because um, if you want to think about our case conceptualization, especially if we are going to use uh, certain modalities, Sometimes we, we think about it uh, like, um, okay, I'll give you a metaphor that is quite simple. I want to cook a chicken soup. For the chicken soup, I need to add the chicken, the carrots, the potatoes, the celery, and some salt and pepper, for example, right? So if I have all the ingredients, but let's say I didn't add the salt, then the chicken soup is not complete. So then I need to find salt and add it in, and the chicken soup will be fixed. So that uh, will be like so-called the privation kind of, of uh, theoretical framework or philosophical framework if I'm going that way. But some people think that the problem is not like one missing ingredient in the chicken soup, it's one additional ingredient. You have the chicken, the potato, the carrots, the celery, you have salt and pepper, but maybe you add something bizarre, maybe like um, car uh, like, like uh, oranges inside, then now the chicken soup tastes really weird and very sour. So in order to fix the chicken soup, if it's possible, you need to take out that orange, then the soup will be fixed, right? So, as a, as a therapist, right, when we're working, working with our clients, um, I mean, just, just, you just think about it. When you see a client who is very uh, neurotic, very anxious, very depressed, or a client who's very, who's even psychotic, having, having delusions about a reality, uh, very severe reality distortions, do you think that it is a problem uh, with the chicken soup having too many ingredients like this is a normal human being plus the psychosis a normal human being plus the anxiety I need to treat the anxiety I need to take out the anxiety which is the equivalent to taking out the orange from the chicken soup and the person will be cured that's, that's definitely one way of thinking about it the other way is to think about it like okay this is a person she's lacking in something and hence is manifesting as anxiety depression psychosis and hence, I need to discover what is the thing that's missing and then add it into the equation and then she will be cured. The chicken soup will then be perfect. Uh, the, the, what's the Italian chef's kiss? Just learned it. So, you might think that, ah, Denise, this is too abstract. Like, like, like why should we even bother thinking about it? You, we should bother thinking about it because it will determine your entire treatment direction. For example, some modalities, for example, like uh, choice theory reality therapy, it's based about on like fulfilling your the five basic needs survival love self-empowerment fun and freedom right if all five needs are met and relationships are stable the person generally is um happy and doing well whatever symptoms manifesting like like the the anxiety the depressing because they love to say in verbs will all disappear when all the five needs are, are well met so in modalities like choice theory, reality therapy, it's about finding what's missing, which, which need is most frustrated. Let's help you satisfy it. And when you satisfy it, the problem will disappear, right? Uh, so you could say that, yeah, so that would be in align to more of the awareness, the privation, the theory of the privation. Okay, compare that to perhaps um, maybe cognitive behavior therapy. The way it's framed is that you, you are anxious because you have a lot of cognitive distortions. 
So cognitive distortions become the additional ingredient that is messing up your soup, which is like the orange that was added into the other ingredients. So in order to fix you, I need to reduce the cognitive distortions by challenging it and helping you to uh, 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 like, what's that, purge yourself of cognitive distortions by, by giving you a sophisticated set of tools so that you can question yourself and then the cognitive distortions will disappear. Actually, as I'm saying this, I sort of understand like perhaps the sophisticated set of tools would be the equivalent of adding the salt into the soup. So either way, right, it is still worthy to consider this because um, as Aquinas continues to deal and to treat the topic of the problem of evil, he will also expand to say like um, evil is illogical. It's like a person who, who does something that he knows is going to be bad for him but he still does it, right? For example, a person has an extramarital affair, a person uh, starts to take drugs and, and gets addicted to them, and, and or starts to get addicted to gambling, all these are illogical. So if we, if we spend our counselling hour, uh, like just totally zoomed into that, like, oh, tell me why you do that. What is your rationale for having this EMA? Why do you take the drugs? And then we just keep evaluating this one behavior. It might be a waste of time because it might not be um, logical. That may not come out like, oh, I do it because uh, something, you know, like something congruent and beautiful and meaningful might come out of it. If, if Aquinas is right, if St. Augustine is right, then nothing really fundamental might come out of it. At the most, we can determine like, okay, I take drugs to meet this need. Then, okay, so what are other activities you can do that are, that are healthier, that are morally upright, that can also meet this, this need? And, and that's all. You'd probably never ever get to an actual, real, uh, concrete, good reason why you're doing the bad thing. On the contrary, when the activity is good, meaningful, then it is congruent and it also has a uh, it's logical, it can make sense. Like, for example, um, uh, maybe people ask me, Denise, why do you serve in church? Or maybe why do you do all the volunteer work? So I can tell you good reasons about it and we can just continue to talk deeper and deeper about what is my key motivations and what keeps me going and all that. So that is a better topic to evaluate. Okay, so I'm going to link later a video about um, the problem of evil by this bunch of Dominican friars uh, they set up a channel called the Thomistic Institute. I love it because all those difficult books that I'll probably never read in my whole life, I'll just watch the summary on the, in these videos. And, and it's good because it's thought-provoking. So sometimes I watch these videos a few times to, to understand it. So in the video, he, it was really nice because he drew a circle, but incomplete circle. So there's a small part that is lacking. So that is to, to illustrate that privation. There's something that is lacking. We need to fill that in. Okay. <clears throat> Not going to just leave you guys here. I'm going to try to implement it in other examples. Let me think, huh? Let me give you a case of anxiety. Okay, this is a good one. Okay, this is a good one and it might be a bit touchy. For example, I'm a counsellor. My job, right, is almost like a frontline worker, like a firefighter. If I see somebody who is in a severe like mental health issue, my job is to run towards that person and offer assistance. However, in spite of the fact that I'm a counsellor, I'm also a human, okay? And if I become very fearful, let's say I become fearful of, of my clients, like, oh, they're behaving so bizarrely, then every single time I go to work, I get anxious and I start to hate my life, hate my job. So how would you case conceptualize a counsellor like me? I'm lacking in something and lacking in possibly maybe the virtue of courage, of fortitude. So to, to cure me, I need to put that in. My chicken soup is missing courage right now. I need to add the courage back in and I will be cured. Okay, that's quite simplistic. If let's say I were to counsel myself and I'm the anxious person, I'll say, so where, where is the source of that fear? From which point do you start to notice that you get scared of your clients? And which particular clients are you scared of? For example, I'm scared of those that have uh, maybe more spiritual manifestations. Oh, this 
client might be possessed or oh this client might be oppressed or obsessed and then oh if I work with her I might get infected then then what is what is missing then in that kind of situation what's missing is faith in God do you believe that the Holy Spirit inside you is strong enough to burn away all this and that if God is putting this person through your door to receive help from you he will also supply and it is not through your own strength but God's grace that the person is healed because if you really believe that then your circle is complete you can go and do the job okay so but with that said I've said all that right it might sound quite pompous people still get burnt out they still get tired and if they don't there's still the risk of um, becoming overly presumptuous and becoming overly proud so that is under the video of prudence I might link it below as well uh, yeah so it is very important to be humble to know your place in the kingdom of God uh, just a tool in the hands of God to help others none of the credit belongs to me everything belongs to God something like that it just becomes such a cliche when I say I feel like I'm just like quoting someone else but it is actually true if ever anybody tells you like Denise is a good counsellor, it's not me and every time I work I just really yes I'm trained in all these modalities, yes I go for counselling, uh, training and ongoing supervision and all that but essentially the thing that makes me good at my job is the the Holy Spirit so all glory to God okay thank you so much for watching this video if you enjoyed it and it was helpful kindly share with your friends and press like and subscribe thank you so much and God bless